and I'm the acting. Good evening. My name is Don Hannon, and I am the acting executive director for the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. I'm honored to welcome you to the fourth and final program in the Why This Matter speaker series. Thank you to everyone who joined us for the first three programs in the series. If you missed any of them, they're all available on demand on YouTube. As you know, the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum is currently undergoing an exciting $21 million expansion. We look forward to inviting you to joining us in person for the grand opening in the summer of 2022. Tonight, you'll learn more about this exciting expansion from Patrick Gallagher. Patrick has been a partner in this project since its inception, and for the past year, and his team and the team from the Holocaust Museum have been working hard designing the new world-class institution that will allow the museum to continue and grow its important work for St. Louis, the region, and beyond. We're grateful that Patrick agreed to join us today to bring us his perspective developed from, based on creating museums around the world and to talk about our project. If you have any questions for Patrick or soon retired museum curator and director of education, Dan Rich, who will be joining Patrick during the Q&A, please utilize the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Now I'm very honored to introduce Carol Steinberg. I wanna thank Carol for her leadership of the successful capital campaign. As campaign chair, Carol was a steadying voice as we navigated the pandemic. We are grateful for her hard work and for joining us tonight. I will now turn things over to Carol for a few introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And thank you everybody uh, for joining us today. As Don said, I'm Carol Steinberg and I am the chair of the uh, capital campaign. And I've been involved in the museum itself for the past 10 years or so, serving as a uh, chair of the development committee and on the executive committee. Uh, when I was asked to be chair of the capital campaign, I had absolutely no hesitation. I had never done anything like this before, but because this project is of such importance, I was willing to take on the challenge. We have raised $21.5 million in the past two and a half to three years, broke ground last November and plan to open in late summer of 2022. The inside, which you will see some of today, is what is going to resonate with our community and beyond. This is the future of how we learn about the Holocaust. The atrocities of the Holocaust will push us to recognize our own biases, have honest dialogue, and hopefully come away with tools to never allow this to happen again. In the Jewish tradition, we are taught to take a place in the world, tikkun olam, repairing the world is of the utmost importance. My hope is for the region to come to the museum and be inspired to do their part once they go out into their own communities. It is my sincere hope that you will find a way to be a part of this important project as a donor, volunteer, or supporter, or all of the above, and continue with us on our exciting journey over the next year. It is now my sincere, uh, it is now my honor to introduce today's featured speaker, Patrick Gallagher. During Q&A, Patrick will be joined by longtime curator and director of education, Dan Rich. Over the past 30 years, Patrick has built a strong reputation globally as a leader in the field of museum planning and design. He has worked with every kind of collection from microscopic stardust to hundreds of vintage military tanks and aircraft in institutions ranging from cultural history and natural science to sports, music, and the arts. A graduate of Northern Illinois University, Patrick is past president of the Society of Experiential Graphic Designers and has served on the board of numerous professional design organizations. Patrick's team at Gallagher and Associates is currently at work designing the new St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. And now I will turn things over to Patrick Gallagher. Thank you, Carol. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. I wish I could convey for you <clears throat> what a dedicated and committed team we get to work with every day in, in St. Louis. 
creating a museum is not just a journey, it's a passion. And this community has made a deep commitment that the voices of their and stories of their survivors will live on as narrators and interpreters to the future. When we started this project, the boards came to me and said, we really want to understand what the next generation of Holocaust Museum should do and should be as part of a community. It gave us a chance to step back and think critically about what an institution should do for a community. And while it's critically important for us to teach the lessons of the Holocaust and to keep that vibrant memory of those Holocaust survivors alive, this museum also was an opportunity for us to think about the future. The visitors that come to this museum live in a world that continually challenges them <clears throat> with various forces that can be intimidating, can be oppressing, and can put them in positions where they are caused to make decisions that they never felt equipped to be able to do. How do we take the stories and the lessons of the Holocaust and put it into a contemporary narr narrative as part of what the challenge was for this institution? We've spent an enormous amount of time designing the core exhibition, and I'm happy to say that within the, the next few short weeks, it will go into production and become a physical reality. The space has been built and it's finished, and we will be fitting it out with all the exhibitions and with the multimedia. A key component to our museum is something called the Impact Lab. And I'll explain to you the Impact Lab because it is a voice to the future. Once we've gotten through a very brisk walkthrough of the new view of the museum. I wanna emphasize again that the board and <clears throat> all the members of the St. Louis community were totally committed to being sure that the voices of their survivors were going to ring true throughout this exhibition. So you'll see how we both introduce and continue their legacy as part of the museum experience. It's those local survivors that make this story so unique. This museum wouldn't work in another community because the stories here are the stories of St. Louis survivors. So it very much has the, the regional flavor and the narrative that goes within the context of its own community. Next slide, Amy. This may be a little challenging to understand, but this is our floor plan. Um, and Don and team and Dan could probably see this floor plan in their dreams. We've looked at it so many times and walls have moved and concepts have moved. But in the broadest perspective of storytelling, the events of the Holocaust are in a chronological narrative, so to speak. So we will follow the evolution of the Holocaust through larger periods of time. The, we are not calling this necessarily a hierarchical legacy of time because we're taking the major events of the Holocaust and looking at them through a series of themes. So the structure of themes are an underpinning to the events and the evolution of time. What you're seeing in the lower left-hand corner in that circle is a major entry theater experience. And just above that is a major exiting experience. So we will introduce the concept of the St. Louis survivor community in a theater, and we will close with their memories as well. So we open and close with a very rich theatrical media presentation. And I will walk you through three-dimensional renderings of all of these spaces in the next few minutes. Next slide, Amy. Here's a view of our entry theater. It's a circular theater where the screen will envelop the visitors and really look at the world before. 
it's important for our visitors to understand what was lost, to understand that these lives were lives and families and communities just like theirs, that the precious nature of what these people cherished in their lives is very similar to what these people cherish in their lives. And understanding that this was the world that was torn from them as we move into the events of the Holocaust is critically important. And it's important for our visitors to humanize and get a perspective of how they can engage with a number that is almost unfathomable with the losses of lives to an individual face of someone who is singing, laughing, and enjoying their family was taken away during the Holocaust and the events that unfold in the next galleries coming to, that they'll be exploring. Next slide, Amy. The journey is one that will be punctuated by the rich collections that the museum has, and they are very strong and very much St. Louis focused collections because they belong to or were part of an individual story. So using our collections pieces, we will tell the story in both two and three dimensional formats. There's opportunities for us to do what we're calling annotated or animated interpretation of an artifact so that a visitor can hear from the voice of, the, of a survivor why that artifact was able to survive the events of the Holocaust and how it arrived in this museum. So we will actually interpret those collections pieces. So in this gallery, you're beginning to see the rise of um, Nazism. There is a timeline that visitors will be able to follow. So the teachers who are teaching the events of World War II and the events of the Holocaust will be able to wrap right into their educational narrative as well. Next slide. This is the <clears throat> nation on fire and Nazis taking control. Throughout this experience, we want <clears throat> our visitors to understand geographically where they are during the events of this Holocaust. So strategic mapping is important in understanding not just the unfolding events of the war, but the unfolding events of the Holocaust. You can see that young man in the red shirt immediately behind him is a theater. So there is a combination of both three-dimensional artifacts, graphic material, very bold and powerful graphic material, and a series of media-based interactives as well for every different kind of visitor to engage in storytelling throughout this museum. Next slide. This is area 2.5, Nazi atrocities spread, the start of World War II. Again, we're using the powerful photography that exists of these events of the camps and the, the proliferation of the Nazi movement throughout Europe. And where the gentleman is standing to your lower right, he's standing in front of one of our annotated artifacts. So the touch screen is to the right as he engages in that, the storytelling related to that particular artifact will unfold. But we wanted the visitors to feel encapsulated or immersed in this story. So the power of the graphics are gonna be an important part of getting visitors to understand that very particular time and place. Next slide. This is area 2.6, the onset of mass murder and implementing the final solution. So again, this geographic definitioning of the development of death camps throughout Europe, both shocking in its scale and also shocking in the impact of its speed of development and its complete movement across the, the European landscape. In the far left behind is an integrated group interactive. So those interactive media pieces, again, will in lot involve visitors to explore at a deeper level, to be able to engage in content that they're particularly interested in and dig into very particular subject matter that they might have 
more interest in or more questions about. Next slide, Amy. The onset of mass murder and the implementing of the final solution, obviously an ch extremely challenging and difficult story. The decisions for picking photography, writing story, picking the artifacts, you can only imagine the museum team spent countless hours thinking carefully about the impact that this will have on its visitors and being sure that the messages and the impact of this story will resonate with them through a sense of understanding, as Carol said, that this can never happen again. Next slide. The, this is the other part of that very large gallery because the story here is powerful. The artifacts here are extremely powerful, as you can see directly in the center of the rendering. We have one of the camp uniforms that has survived and becomes one of the treasures of this institution. Artifacts for many visitors are the sense of reality for storytelling. It gives them that truth, if you will, for understanding the story and understanding context that these were people's lives. These were individual stories. Off to the left is another one of our interactive table surfaces where visitors can be involved and listen to stories from survivors so that the narration is always punctuated by the stories that come from our St. Louis survivors. Next slide. Encountering the camps is part of understanding the complex network of death camp systems that the Nazis built throughout Europe. Uh, I think we know that for many of our visitors, they may know about one particular camp or have heard stories or watched a film. This, this experience will really take them into that idea in a much deeper level where they'll have a much broader sense of understanding how 6 million lives were lost. Next slide, Amy. Those who made the Holocaust possible are really looking at all the different roles and perspectives of the story of the Holocaust. Who were all the players? What, what was their involvement? And how could something like this really take place? This sense of engaging an audience in a story that at times is so large and so broad by personalizing the perspectives both from a very positive but also an extremely negative perspective gets them to understand this is what's possible. This is what one human being can do to another. And I want you to think about that as we move forward later in the presentation and talk about the impact lab. Next slide, please. The resistors. I think this is one of the more important and critical stories in this museum. Resistance has, for many visitors, the opportunity to put clarity on the perspective of how could they just stand back? How did they not fight? And the resistance story is one that will help them in understanding those who did fight and why. And bringing to life that the, not only those resistors were able to save lives, but those resistors stood up. And again, an important part of thinking about the lessons of this experience as they move out of the museum and into their own world, what that concept of being a resistor or being an upstander really could mean. Next slide. The Liberators, they, I think that this museum now has a chance to expand on that liberation story. The liberation story is really not the end of the story, but it's a transitional moment in the story and the events of the war. And liberation for many visitors will, who are not of Jewish descent, descent but might have had family who served in World War II 
really brings the story into a much more personal perspective that their family or a member of their family may have been touched by the events of the Holocaust and World War II, potentially through a story of the liberators. Next slide. Victims, obviously continuing to look deeper at the complex nature of lives lost and being sure that visitors understand that our over 6 million Jews, Jewish lives that were lost, others were lost as well. And contextualizing that as part of the events of the Holocaust is important for this museum and will be an important part of learning and understanding the entire context of the story for all of our visitors. Next slide. This is the beginning of the survivor's gallery is really the beginning of how the visitors close their journey to this museum. It's a chance for us to now truly illuminate the St. Louis community survivor community in a much more personal and direct way. While they'll have heard their voices throughout the museum, really bringing context to the events of the Holocaust, here is a chance for us to really personalize them and get visitors to understand not just how they survived, but how they flourished. So our survivors experience is a journey for our visitors of really getting a much more personal perspective of what each of the, these individuals experienced and how they came to this country and rebuilt their lives. Next slide. Choices and challenges really is an area that gives our visitors a chance to engage again, not just with the stories of the survivors, but a perspective of the survivors. So it allows us to really take individuals or groups of individuals to tell very focused stories. And again, that chance for visitors who are interested to spend more time with the survivor stories because they are compelling and they are the sense of, in a lot of ways, the most important artifacts this museum has. Amy, next slide. The power of testimony here just before our last closing theater, the survivors will come on screen and talk about that, how they built their lives in America and particularly here in St. Louis. And we want our visitors to feel a personal connection with these individuals. So there are a series of media experiences where we'll use our documentation of our survivor testimonials to really have our visitors understand in that very personal way how these survivors rebuilt their lives in St. Louis. Next slide. And as part of that, this last theater, while reflective of the original theater that they went in that introduced to their visitors the, what was lost, this is celebrating what these survivors rebuilt for themselves. They'll hear the voices, they'll hear the laughter, they'll see their families, they'll see them in the St. Louis community as survivors. And the fact that they stand as a proud message that they were able to rebuild their lives, it is a critical way for anyone who experiences this to realize the full circle of the experiences of the Holocaust, from what these people lost to what they were able to rebuild. So you've taken a very quick and very topical overview of the museum. And obviously there's a great deal more detail. We would be here for many days if I took you through all the individual interpretive elements and all the individual media pieces. But I wanted you to get a flavor for 
what this museum will do in its power of storytelling. The embracing of survivor stories, the unfolding of the events of the Holocaust through their voices and the rebuilding story each become for us an opportunity to think about how the legacy of this museum will continue to live on. You wanna to go to the next slide, Amy? I just wanna point out, we do have a, a reflection area that will our visitors will be able to stop and contemplate their own thoughts, think about the experiences that they had, talk to their family, talk to the people that they experienced the museum with. We know that museums motivate conversation, they motivate questions, and it will be important to have a place for them to, to gather their thoughts and prepare themselves to go back into their own worlds. And then our last slide tonight, I think, oh, just a quick look. This is a very quick look into the Impact Lab. Many of you have heard about the Impact Lab. We are in development of the Impact Lab right now. It is going to be an interactive learning environment that will be open to schools and all visitors. And it will be our chance to take the lessons of the Holocaust and turn that lens on the events of what's happening in our world today and allow our visitors to ask the questions of, what, can, what would I have done? What can I do? And how can the stories of the Holocaust bring into perspective the events that, of the world that are happening right now in a way that will get our visitors to think about what their responsibilities are to both their families and their communities and themselves. And using actual events, the educational staff will create curriculum and experiences that will make visitors role players and challenge them to answer and engage in content in a very dynamic way. This is part of the legacy of the St. Louis Holocaust Center for the future. It will be a center that has a format that allows for new programming to happen on an ongoing basis that addresses issues that the St. Louis community faces and will bring in in a very neutral and non-judgmental way a chance or a place to have those dialogues and to have the critical discussions that can in fact reflect on some of the events that have taken place in the Holocaust. This isn't a comparison as much as it is using it as a springboard to open up the important and oftentimes very difficult discussions that are happening in communities like St. Louis and around our country today. So hopefully in the very near future, we'll have another Why This Matters event and we'll focus just on the Impact Lab where we'll be able to show you a full journey through this. This has been the hardest part of this museum to create and design, but I think it will be one of the more important pieces of creating the legacy for the next generation. Thank you. Dan, I'm gonna turn it over to you to see if we can field some questions. Thank you. Thank you for your very illuminating presentation. Given the, the theme and the title of our, our entire series, let me begin by asking in the broadest sense, why this matters? Why does this museum project, why is this museum project important and how will it be an asset to the St. Louis and larger region? I'll, I'll feel the first Dan and then I, maybe you can follow it up. I, I think that in, 
I hope that you understood that as you use this museum as a sense of understanding the, the horrific events of the Holocaust, you're dealing with stories that are very much in a, a personalized and we're asking our visitors to understand not just how the events impacted the lives of individuals in the Holocaust, but those who were responsible as well. That will ultimately get them to think about their own life because we know with young people today, when they go to a museum, the first question they ask is, why does this matter for me? Well, it matters for me because this could happen again. And in a lot of ways, events similar to this are happening again. And they have to ask themselves, and we want to encourage them to ask themselves, what would I do? And why does this matter to me? So the interpretive narrative throughout the museum will, we believe, engage people in a sense of a much more personal perspective of understanding this story and understanding that, yes, this can happen again. Dan, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that says it well. We have a question if there are plans to incorporate a memorial wall within the museum so that members of the community can memorialize their loved ones who perished in the Holocaust would also be another way to support the museum. There, the museum currently has a memorial garden and that garden will continue. Um, and it's, it won't be expanded, but it will have a refresh as part of the new museum. So there has always been a memorial garden here and that will, be con that will continue to be an important part of the museum in the future. I believe there will also be a pavers project. There'll be more information about that soon. That will also be a way to uh, memorialize or honor. Uh, what were the team's inspirations for the exhibition design? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, I think that the if you really look at the largest perspective of the design, it's it really occupies an enormous amount of historical photography. And the photography that exists of the Holocaust is powerful, palpable, and we believe an opportunity to give a sense of of reality to the storytelling. So we've really used the photography as an immersive opportunity. So that adding to that its own individual color palettes and without getting into a deep narrative about how color impacts people, there was a lot of discussion about color, the graphic language. Right? It, it's all set as a means in a way to impact the visitors in some cases differently in one gallery than another gallery, but consistently by using that photography because it's the really, it's the truth or the evidence of the events of the Holocaust. How are artifacts for this or any other museum obtained? Dan, I would, I would let you talk about how your <laughs> artifacts came to your museum. So for many years, uh, we've been the repository of donations from survivors, from their families, from other members of the community. And one of the wonderful things about the new expansion is we'll finally have room to show so many more of them. It was always, um, let's say frustrating, but for every artifact that was out on view in the museum. There were so many others, uh, similar or slightly different. So now we will have so much more uh, space uh, for that. Also, maybe it's one of the silver linings of COVID. While a lot of people were at home, they were cleaning their attics. And while this is an ongoing thing, 
uh, Diane, our archivist, and Jillian and I have been getting a lot of calls in the past year. We came across my grandfather's stuff he brought back from as a veteran. Do you want that? Yes. We came across documents. Do you want this? Yes. So uh, I would really say not just documents, but artifacts and some powerful things that uh, people say, would you want this? And if it's from our community, the answer is yes. So that's really how we've acquired the artifacts for our collection. And something else that maybe I can answer, uh, how can resources of the St. Uh, Louis Holocaust Museum be shared with students and adults in all parts of Missouri? Uh, while of course we encourage people to come to our museum as a destination for the exhibits, for the programming, uh, we also have our trunk program, ways to get materials into classrooms throughout the state to empower teachers to teach about this subject in their classrooms. And uh, I wanna say something about the Missouri Commission uh, for the Holocaust and its uh, learning and awareness that also is gonna be a very powerful tool to spread this information as, as powerfully as we can throughout the state. I would also add, Dan, that the Impact Lab the programming and materials that will be in the impact lab will also be available online. Will, there was a question if there would be seating for individuals and groups. Yes, there will. Will the audio presentations be supported by closed captioning option for those of us who are hearing impaired or who, who have a hearing impairment? Yes. The answer is yes. How long will it take for a visitor to thoroughly experience the new museum? Will videos, audios, artifacts be static or rotate over time? P.S. Kudos on an outstanding design, including addressing the sensitive subject of collaboration. The, the length of time and will things change? Length of time, we consider an average visit somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour. And that's a very fast paced topical experience. You could spend many hours in this museum if you read through and listened to all the oral histories. And we wanna be able to accommodate the many different kinds of learners and the people who come with frankly shorter attention spans and those who are here committed to uh, really spending a much more in-depth amount of time in the museum. So there are opportunities at a high level to really understand the story in a 45 minute to an hour experience. You certainly can go in much, much deeper in any of the theme galleries that you're interested in that could keep you there for many, many hours. Where will there be info on the history of anti-Semitism? And is the spiral of hate incorporated into some of the galleries? Anti-Semitism is dealt with right in one of our first galleries as you come out of the theater. So anti-Semitism is direct is dealt with direct immediately and will continue throughout. And actually, anti-Semitism is a subject matter that will continue to be discussed and and explored in the impact lab as well as just one of the many perspectives of the impact lab. Um, uh, the reference of spiral of hate in particular, uh, Dan, I would, I would ask you to address that. The, the spiral of hate will be a very important component of the impact lab, but we are talking about finding ways so that the, the elements of that spiral, I know many of you are familiar with, will also hark back to elements in the permanent exhibit. Assuming you've experienced the exhi exhibit Auschwitz not long ago and not far away, now in Kansas City. Hold on. Sorry.
Give me a second, sorry. How, if referring to that exhibit, how, if at all, did it inspire or influence the design of this museum? Not at all. Um, the exhibit opened in New York right before the impact of COVID. Um, I think we're all entitled to our own perspectives of how powerful that was or what it will do. Um, it, from a professional perspective to me was carried, was heavily laden obviously in some very powerful artifacts that came from Auschwitz. I, I think it was lighter on narrative and learning than it should have been, um, but that's just my own personal perspective. It, it would have no, it, it did and would have no impact on what we've done here because we were, we were well into design before that opened. Your slideshow featured individuals or small groups touring the museum. How do you see a docent led tour with a school group occurring, especially allowing time for interactive exhibits and also the impact lab and a speaker? We're working on that program right now. And so we're the, how docents will activate the museum is an important part of how the museum will operate. And we're working on that program right now. Let me just add docents will be central to the uh, visitor's experience. When you consider the central role and the importance of bringing the huge numbers of students getting off buses um, we're going to need docents more than ever. Uh, timing is something we're working on and giving a great deal of thought and consideration to. Uh, Patrick, what has been the most challenging part of this museum design? What has been the most rewarding? Hmm. Uh, challenging is always, uh, I would say challenging is there's never enough space. If we could make it bigger, it would always be bigger. Um, the, the process of really understanding what's important to tell and how you create it, you always wish you had more space. And, and I think that's a discipline that this team has taken very seriously and worked in, incredibly well with. And we, I, I, and I think Dan can vouch for this. We, many of these galleries have been designed and redesigned many, many times, just to be sure that COVID was helpful for us and it gave us a chance to really step back and think through the design process really critically. So I'm very happy with the results because I think it's reflective of an enormous amount of thought and an enormous amount of input as well so that they, the content team would always know what the design team was struggling with. The design team would always know what the content team was struggling with. And we would really work together to come up with what we felt was the best solutions for the visitors. And many times that meant going back to the drawing boards. Many times that meant the content team going back to finding a different perspective or a different individual story. Where will traveling exhibits be displayed? Thank you, can't wait for it to open, a must-see museum. There is a, there is a temporary exhibition space uh, that's being built right now. So there's, we'll have, the museum will have an excellent changing exhibition space that will allow them to bring outside exhibits in and to create their own exhibitions. Will there be an auditorium to sit and ask questions, et cetera? There will, there's a beautiful auditorium as part of the building renovation. And um, it, it will be used for both programming, 
event programming and education. And I think people will be thrilled when they see the new auditorium. What are the ways that the staff can assess the impact of the HMLC on its visitors? How can data be gathered to assess effectiveness? Just as a <clears throat> one way, one perspective is going to be how they engage in the impact lab. All of our interactives have will have um, systems built in that will allow the curatorial and education teams every night to see how visitors engage with the content, the kind of interaction they had. And it will allow us to not only adjust, should there be a need to adjust, but also see what visitors are more interested in that can add to the potential of programming or special events or special exhibitions. And let me just add, coincidentally, we had a staff meeting yesterday just to discuss assessment, uh, measurable goals, metrics, et cetera, outcomes. So we're really considering those going in so that those issues are being very carefully considered. How would you rate the technology being used to other museums? It's appropriate for this museum. And I think that that's not a, I'm not trying to, avoid that answer, I'm trying to tell you that every museum needs to think through carefully how technology fits for both their subject and the kind of experience they want to have. And I think we have a very balanced perspective. I've seen many institutions that lean too far with too much media and interactivities and some that I believe haven't done enough. Media in its broadest sense also needs to embrace things like theater. And I think the theaters here are going to be incredibly powerful. So the, the chance to use a diversity of types of media will help to modulate that experience for visitors throughout. And I think we've done a really good job in appropriately balancing it here. Will you incorporate a world map of where genocides are taking place today? Um, I'm. I, I thought I answered that it, going through the presentation, but I'll really reemphasize this. In mapping will be an important tool throughout the museum. It's an educational element for the teachers as they bring their groups through and their students through because understanding both the geography of Europe and the events that took place in the Holocaust is important to understand the powerful nature of the movement of the Nazi party across Europe. So mapping will be, I would, you're gonna see mapping in almost every gallery. In addition to that, the idea of genocides taking place today will be addressed in the impact lab. Absolutely. Do you, uh, with all due respect to the importance of educating school groups, will there be any adults only time for more contemplative visits to the museum? I would guess there would be. Remember with students and student groups, they typically occupy museums in the morning they need to get back at lunch or immediately after. So museums, you, you typically don't see students, particularly in the afternoon or in the weekends. The impact lab will be set up as well for adults, not just students. So you're going to you'll see um, you'll see a variety of different opportunities for engagement. If you want to go when there are no students, don't go in the morning. Very good. Do you have a favorite museum or exhibition that you've designed? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Um, one that's closest to me because I've spent almost 13 years working on it is the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Um, 
it's been a part of my life for a long time and we just broke ground on our seventh building there and it's it's i think a, not only a powerful museum but it's it's done a lot of things that have really advanced the narrative of the impact of world war ii and our last building is on it's titled liberation but it's on the legacy of the events of world war ii all the way up to today so it it will bring the events of world war ii full circle and so that one's particularly close to me but right now this one's very close to me because we're about to go into fabrication I want, to, I want to thank Patrick Gallagher once again for his enlightening presentation. I also want to acknowledge all of the speakers, as well as my capable colleagues who made this four-part lecture series such a success. United by the theme, the significant question, why this matters, we've explored issues of anti-Semitism, Holocaust education, media literacy and this evening, focusing close to home, the expansion of the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. If you missed any of these programs, they are available on our YouTube site. Dan, can I add one last comment? Sure. I, um, being a museum planner and designer, no museum ever sees the light of day without an incredible, incredible commitment from the many, many donors and supporters of the museum. The philanthropic nature of the St. Louis community has been profound to me. And for the community to be able to raise the money to create this museum in the short period of time, those of you who are from St. Louis should be proud that there are people that feel that this is such an important institution that they got behind it. So it's as a community, the St. Louis community, far beyond many other communities I work with, has raised the money for this institution faster than any museum I've ever worked with. And, and you should all be very proud and very thankful you have those kind, kind of people living within the context of your community. Thanks for those additional comments. Responding to a question comment uh, that came earlier, acknowledging I was departing at a very exciting time. And did I have anything to say? Yes. I was really pleased and honored when I was offered the opportunity to make closing remarks this evening, because as many of you know, my tenure at the museum is drawing to a close. When I first came to the Holocaust Museum from an art museum, several people asked me how I felt about moving from a place celebrating creativity to a place focusing on a much darker subject. And I said, I don't know, ask me in a year. Here I am 22 years later uh, and still having spent all those years here. I stayed because for all the darkness, there have been countless flashes of light in the history to learn about individuals and groups who at great risk rescued Jews, to learn about Jews who engaged in armed resistance or who would not relinquish their humanity or their faith. I had the opportunity to meet survivors, my greatest teachers, I heard their harrowing stories of courage and faith, and I learned their lessons of resilience. I worked with volunteers and docents, docents committed to teaching this challenging subject, this challenging history and its lessons, the lessons of the Holocaust to as many visitors, especially young people as possible. And I've worked with incredible colleagues past and present, several of whom were significant mentors. So why this matters, re revolving back, why what we do matters. In cleaning out my office, as I had to do because of the expansion, as well as my retirement, 
I came across some files. I'm sure many of you who have seen my office know that that was a daunting Herculean task. Herculean and the Aegean stables being the best example. But in that process, I've been cleaning out files. I came across remarks I made on October 11th, 1999, at a lovely reception welcoming me to the museum. And I quote what I said then, through the messages our visitors take away, we can change attitudes and take steps to blot out intolerance and hate. Through our programs, events, and workshops, we can instill values of mutual respect and a sense of vigilance so the fruits of hate, genocide, and the violation of human rights will not happen. So here's the good part. Timing is crucial. Current events nationally and internationally are ringing warning alarms. The time to teach about the Holocaust and its lessons is now. And in my notes, there were three exclamation points. Again, this is October, 1999. I'd like to think we gave our best effort to achieving these goals, but 22 years later, it's very clear there is much more to do. The alarm bells are still ringing and way too loudly. With the museum team now in place and the ongoing support of our very supportive community, coupled with the amazing museum, which is going to open summer of 2022, the history and lessons of the Holocaust will continue to be taught from generation to generation. And I know the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Museum will grow from strength to strength. Wishing those of you who are celebrating a happy new year and wishing all of you a joyous, healthy, and peaceful season. Thank you and good night. <laughs>